Well, good morning, everyone. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. All right, couple of announcements, and it's not in the... Uh, it's not in the bulletin. I had some issues with um, Instant Church Directory this week, and I was not able to get my email out until yesterday. But um, a couple of things that will be on here that I want to make sure that um, we start getting out there now. Start making your plans now for the Memorial Day Parade, okay? So the Memorial Day Parade is going to be on Memorial Day, right? That's pretty easy. On Monday, it's going to be on Memorial Day. And we want a bunch of us from church to be marching in the parade, okay? So, so make your plans, adults, um, children, our youth group, we want to be marching on the parade, okay? There's going to be a lot of details that come out about it. So I was talking to, to John over here, who is, you know, he's kind of an idea guy, right? And he, and he said to me in a very sincere way, like, it doesn't make sense that we've won the Chile Championship three years in a row, and in three years, haven't even gotten a ribbon for our parade float. So we're going to try to make this the year. Yeah, we go for the sweep, chili and the parade, right? We got to get the whole thing. So be thinking about that to be available. Um, with that, there's a few things you could be doing now. If you have a child that, that you're a member of the church and you have a child that's between the ages of like kindergarten and high school, if you have not gotten a Fairhaven shirt, we like to buy a shirt for all of our students, okay? Please let me know, and we'll make sure to get you a shirt, okay? If you've gotten one in the past, that's awesome. If you've not gotten one, please let me know, and we'll get you a shirt. Also, we like to throw out candy for the parade. You can start now by bringing in candy. If you see deals on candy or whatever, and we'll store it somewhere, um, bring it in, and uh, we'll use that, okay? So that's going to be coming up. We'll get that in the bulletin and start, start getting the message out more on that, but I, I wanted to make sure I brought it up today because I'm really excited about that for this year. Also, something I need to know, um, last year we did not have a lot of graduates in our graduating class. This year we have a bunch. Like I'm looking out here right now and I see Ellie, Abby, Austin, Joey. That's just four that I, Brooklyn. I saw Brooklyn here somewhere. We have a lot of kids that are going to be graduating. Please, please, oh, Aaron, I already skipped over Aaron, sitting right here. Please let me know um, if you're graduating so that that way we're ready for graduation Sunday. We're going to get you a little something, okay? So please let me know uh, if you're graduating this year. Awesome. Uh, last announcement for now, Center of Hope, we're uh, collecting peanut butter and jelly. I don't know if you guys saw on our Facebook page, I shared what the Center of Hope shared, that last week with the ramen noodles and the peanut butter and the jelly and all that stuff, we did what, like the, the biggest single donation that they had received so far, which is so cool, right? So for the next month, we're going to be collecting peanut butter and jelly. I just want to answer a couple of questions that I got, okay? You can bring it in anytime, number one. Number two, if you find a deal just on jelly, that's okay. It doesn't have to be peanut butter and jelly. Someone asked me if I just bring in jelly, is that okay? Yes, or peanut butter. Someone also asked me, let's say you find a really good deal on Goober Grape, like the one that's peanut butter and jelly mixed, we'll take that too, okay? So anything like that, if you find it on, on special or find it on deal, bring it in and we'll get that over to the center of hope. And I think that covers, oh, yeah, I think that covers it. Yeah. All right. Prayer requests, a couple of prayer requests that we'll make sure we put out there. Um, thank you all. Graham is home and feeling better. And now it's Gramps' turn to, uh, turn to feel sick. Gramp is home and not feeling very well. He's got bronchitis slash possibly the beginnings of pneumonia. He's home and he's feeling better, but please pray for him uh, that, that he gets better. Pray for DJ Kaufman, Susan's son. Um, he's going through some stuff, and we've been praying for him for the last couple of weeks, so continue to uh, keep him in your prayers. Also, it's not updated on here, but... Um, Dave, Bar uh, Dave Varndell, our friend that we've been praying for with cancer, he is home now. So um, continue to pray that he gets better. Um, Eric Corwin got great news back from his treatment and he's feeling better. So continue to pray for Eric. Continue to pray for Dan Lacey's mom's friend. Any update on her in Haiti? Okay. Pray for them. If you haven't seen, um, Lacey's mom's friend runs an orphanage in Haiti. And the country is on the verge of collapse. 
and they're having a hard time not only getting supplies, but just keeping safe. It's, it's pretty dangerous there. So uh, pray for her as well. Also, next week is uh, the start of our Emmaus weekend. The men's weekend is next week, and we're going to be sending uh, Matt Just and Jared Collins um, as pilgrims, and then uh, Dave McIntyre, Rick Lega, and myself are going to be on team. And then the week after that, uh, we're going to be sending Dawn and Vicki Just and um, Carissa Decker, Bill and, and uh, Lisa Decker's daughter, and my wife Lori will be on that team. So pray for that. And that's another one, too, where... We always like to say, you know, those weekends um, and the pilgrims that we sponsor and everything, that's all, you know, we feel strongly about it as a church that it's a good thing for uh, people to to attend it, to have gone through and experienced it. And uh, the, the, the church, through really all of our, our giving and our generosity, we pay all the fees for the pilgrims, for the team members to, to attend. So if you have any questions on that ever, please let me know. And uh, be in prayer for it um, on, on those upcoming weekends. Um, yes. So for this week, and, I, and I'll throw this out there, if you know Matt, you know Jared, you know, um, and if for many of you, he doesn't attend church here specifically, but we still claim him. If you know Dave Baird, who, uh, you know, a big Rootstown uh, supporter, community supporter, and you would, lo um, would love to, write them a letter of encouragement or anything, we would love to have that. Um, so get those to me or see me, see me about those. Same thing with the ladies as well. Anything else? Anything else we could be lifting up in prayer, praying for? Any blessings uh, this week that we should acknowledge and pray for? Lacey. Rick back visiting. We have lots of visitors today. We got Rick. So the reason why I don't acknowledge visitors, and I'm going to tell you all why, but welcome very much. We, we love having visitors, and I'm going to tell you right now why I don't acknowledge visitors from up north. I was a young, naive, strapping young man of 21 years old. And my wife said to me, we're going to date, and you have to come to church. So, I walk into church, I sit down in the back. It's my first time going to a non-Catholic church. And I couldn't understand why all of these people were coming up to me and shaking my hand and smiling at me. I was like, guy, just leave me alone. I'm coming in, I'm just going to sit, I'm going to watch, and then I'm going to leave like I do when I go to St. Anthony's. I don't need to be bothered by anything, right? I got all these people, hey, yeah. So I sit down in the back. Okay, so I'm just sitting there. Lots of people, you know, they're like staring at me and whatever. And the way they were set up, Pastor Kelsey had a place where he stood here to sing. And behind him, on, on like chairs and risers, was the choir, okay? And my girlfriend, Lori, my wife now, was part of the choir, right? So I sat by myself and I'm watching. So Pastor Kelsey does this thing, which I guess he does every week. And he just go. everyone sits down and he goes, do you have any visitors here that we would like to introduce? And I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is going to happen. And I looked up out of the crack of my eye, and there was this guy that I knew. His name was Mitch. And my wife is standing, my girlfriend is standing there, and he starts going. And she goes, that guy sitting over there? That's my boyfriend, Vince. And I'm like, this is the worst day of my entire <laughs> life. So I don't introduce visitors just because, I don't know, now it's different. But I will say this to everyone that's visiting. Welcome here very, very much. Rick is not really a visitor. He's, been, he's, he's a member of the church. Just We worship in different places now, that's all. Um, but for those that are visiting, please make yourselves at home. Restrooms, all that, all that good stuff. We, we, uh, we love having you here. Um, but thank you. It is good to have you here. Thank you. And for bringing back that trauma. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. It was funny, though. The first time I went in there, because you, know, you go to Catholic Church, you walk in, you walk out. No one knows anything, you know, but that one, whew, had a lot of eyes on me that day. I remember that. Anything else we could be praying for? 
all right, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do this now. Today we are going to celebrate communion. And just so we don't have to, to, to do the, the instructions right before communion, we go forward to it, I want to give a little bit of instructions about communion, okay? First off, if you are visiting, you haven't been here, we, we celebrate an open table. So if you believe in Jesus as your Savior, and even if you are, you know, regularly attend another church, you are more than welcome to celebrate communion with us here, okay? More than welcome to celebrate communion with us here. Today we're going to be celebrating a way that, that I, I like to do it. We haven't done it this way in a while. We're going to be celebrating by intention, okay? Which basically is a Greek word that means grip, rip, and get, okay? That's all it means. We're going to come up. Someone's going to, yeah, right? We're going to be holding a piece of bread. We're going to be holding a piece of bread. And when you come up to the piece of bread, just take a piece. Now, here's the thing. Grab it with your hand and give it a, give it a good rip, okay? And if all you're doing is taking your piece of bread and you're not touching it, you don't have to worry about anyone else touching your piece, okay? You're going to rip it. Then when you take it, take a nice piece of bread. We have plenty of bread here, okay? Take a nice piece of bread because you want it to be big enough that when you come to the cup and dip it, right, you can get bread in there without getting knuckles in there, right? Right? I'm just, no, I'm just... And plus, the Lord is good. The Lord is abundant. We don't need to just take a crumb. Just take a nice piece of bread, okay? So you come up, you take the bread, you go over, you dip it a little bit, and then you eat it. And that is open to everybody. And one last thing, since I'm reliving my childhood here, if, if, a, if, if your piece of bread falls, right, if it falls in the cup or if it falls on the ground, no need to freak out. Just go right back to the big piece, rip off another one, and just keep on going. We'll, 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 we'll clean it up after. One time, I was eight years old. A piece of communion dropped. And oh my goodness, it was, it was a really big deal. That is not a big deal. Okay? We, we will take care of it after. I just wanted to share that because I know that there, we haven't done it this way in a while. So I want to make sure we're all good. All right? We're all good? All right, brothers and sisters. It is a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Why don't you stand with me and we'll open up our worship service this morning.
Brothers and sisters, let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you have given us, Lord. We thank you for this day where we can gather together as brothers and sisters in the faith. Lord, where we can worship you in your house as your family. Lord Jesus, we love you and just get us ready for this day. Lord, we ask that you forgive us of our sins. We pray, Lord, that you wipe us clean, that you let us stand justified in your presence because of your shed blood, because of your sacrifice. And Lord, we lift up to you the prayers of the church. We pray for Graham and Graham. We continue to pray for, for uh, Dave Varndell and for Eric and for Ann and for all of, of, our, of our friends and family that are struggling with cancer, Lord God. We lift up to you DJ Kaufman. And pray, Lord, that you would be with him through his trials and tribulations. We lift up for you the teacher at Brimfield Elementary, Lord, and we pray for, for that entire st school district, for students, for teachers, for that teacher's family, and pray that your presence can be felt among them, that they may know who you are as this teacher gets ready to cross from this life to the next. Lord Jesus, let them feel your peace. Let them feel your presence. Pray for Jan and for what's going on in Haiti, that you and your angels, Lord, would be protecting them, watching over them, keeping them safe. Lord, we lift up to you all of our other prayers that have gone unspoken. You know all things. There's nothing that we can hide from you, Lord. And you tell us in your word to cast all of our anxieties and all of our cares upon you, for you love us. So, Lord, give us the humility to do that. Lord, we pray for our church. We pray for the mission that you have given your church of being a light in the darkness, of sharing the gospel with a world that desperately needs it, of letting people know of the power that is in the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, we pray for the gifts that we receive today. We pray that they're given with cheerful and generous hearts, knowing that all things come from you and all things return to you. And Jesus, on this day, on this first Sunday in April, in which we celebrate communion, let us also, Lord, close our prayer by all of us lifting our voices to heaven and praying the words, Lord, that you taught us to pray. And we all pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Um, ushers, come forward. Please stand.
Father, thank you so much for this beautiful day that you've given to us for the sunshine. Lord, thank you for the spring where uh, new things are born and coming into uh, creation. Lord, I thank you for each person that's here today. Lord, I pray that you'd be with each of us. I pray that you'd be with um, each of us to deal with the struggles that we're going through each day. I pray that you would help those who are hurting, those who are grieving. I pray that you'd be with those who are struggling with certain issues and pray that you be with those who are sick that can't be with us today. Lord, I pray that you be with Pastor Vince this morning as he delivers his message that we apply what he has to say to our, our lives so that others can see you through us. And we pray all these things in your name. You may be seated. All right, so today as we continue on in our Easter series, we're going to be in the Gospel of John chapter 20. The Gospel of John chapter 20, we're going to read verses 11 to 31, and for the message, we'll really be focused on verses 24 to 31. And we're going to be talking about a couple of things. We're going to be talking about the purpose of John writing this Gospel, which is in this section of Scripture that we're going to read. But we're also going to be talking about doubts, and Thomas, and having kind of doubts and questions and how to get them answered. And I have to tell you, brothers and sisters, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to put this out there. I think as Christians, we worry way too much about the wrong thing. We have way too much anxiety about the wrong things. And I want you to hear this. I say this to you not as someone who doesn't struggle with that. And, you know, in the letter of the Romans, Paul wrote that he was the chief of all sinners. And I could literally stand in front of you right now and say that I'm the chief of all worriers. There is no one who worries and has more anxiety than I do. I'm telling you that right now. And a lot of it is unfounded. In fact, I'm going to give you a great example. I'm just giving you this as kind of like where we're going to be in the message before we get into our scripture reading. This last week, I don't know if it was Tuesday or Wednesday, I was watching one of my TV idols, Mark Johnson, Channel 5 Weather, okay? I, I believe in Mark Johnson. That dude is spot on. Do you know what he said on Tuesday? He said that the National Weather Service, for the first time in 11 years, had Northeast Ohio under threat level 5 for tornadic activity. We, have, we never experienced threat. So be ready. Have your plan for tomorrow because threat level 5 is coming. I'm going to tell you right now. I had already in my head envisioned my entire neighborhood as if a nuclear bomb had gone off, like everything gone. And I thought, okay, so tomorrow I'm either going to get whisked away like the dad on Twister at the beginning of Twister, or I'm going to be under a pile of rubble. They won't be able to get to me in, in time, and I'll die with my dog Marcy sitting next to me whimpering as I'm dead. This is already what was in my head. I was so nervous about this that I made plans. I actually made plans to be home by 4.30, because Mark Johnson said, the heavy stuff's going to hit at 5. And I'm like, I'm driving Lucy home from Kent Roosevelt, and it's 4.39, and I'm like, dude, there better not be any one of them. I may, I may break the speed limit, which I never do. Okay? Does anyone know what happened on that Tuesday night? It didn't even rain! <laughs> it didn't even rain! And I'm not kidding you, I almost had a stroke! over this thing. What am I worried about this stuff? Like, sometimes we get so worried about stuff that just ain't. It's not even important. And we let it, because you know what? Now I sit here and laugh, okay? Now I sit here and laugh. But as I look back on it, I robbed family, my kids, myself, God, of an entire afternoon, because I was sketching out, oh, what is going to happen, right? Why? Why? We do that way too much as Christians. Now I'm teasing about it, talking about on a tornado horn, right? But we do that same thing when it comes to finances, when it comes to our job, when it comes to our games, when it comes to our health. We'll make ourselves sick worrying about our health. 
right? These are just, just why? And that's what I'm going to talk about, worrying, doubting, having this kind of anxiety. So turn with me. We're going to be, Mar we're going to be John chapter 20, starting at verse 11, and we're going to read through verse 31. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head, the other at the foot. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? And they, they have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried them away, him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned towards him and she cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, to the father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my father your fa and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord, she told them. She told them that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood with them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. Lord Jesus, come and fill this place with the Holy Spirit. Fill our hearts with the Holy Spirit. and Make them tender to the leading of your word. Fill our ears and our minds with the Holy Spirit and make them attentive to your word, that we may learn your word, that we may love your word, that we may live your word. And we ask for this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. So the man of the hour that we're going to be talking about today is the Apostle Thomas, oftentimes referred to as Doubting Thomas. And actually, that name, Doubting Thomas, is so common that we even use it colloquially, right? It's an idiomatic expression for someone that doubts, right? If you call someone a Doubting Thomas... You're saying that there's someone that just is skeptical, that is not going to believe. You know, the reality is Thomas is not mentioned all that often in Scripture. But there are some examples where we get a glimpse into what Thomas was like. We've seen that he's like us. He had his share of unsettling experiences with Jesus. In John chapter 11, we see a great picture of Thomas. In John chapter 11, we see that Lazarus is dying. And Mary and Martha send for Jesus. Jesus makes the decision to go back to Bethany, to go back to Judea, to help his friend Lazarus. Now everyone knew that going back to Judea was going to be dangerous. Because the Jewish authorities were after him and that's where they were. But Jesus decided, we're going. And what was Thomas's response? When in John eleven sixteen 16 it says, Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. Thomas knew there was going to be danger, and he acknowledged that. Let's go. We're going to end up dying with him. Then there were times where Thomas, like us, struggled with the direct knowledge or revelation of, of what Jesus had shared with them. And John, we see that in John 14. 
here there's Jesus revealing himself to the apostles and who he is. And Thomas has a very human response. So this is in John chapter 14, starting at verse 1. Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. And then Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And I, I, I always I have to stop there. I always have to laugh at that. Thomas, has, at this point, has spent three years with Jesus, night and day with Jesus. And Jesus says, I'm going. I'm going to go prepare a place for you. And Thomas goes, where are you going? What are we, how are we supposed to get there? We don't even know. Right? That, it, it's just so weird to me. After three years with Jesus. But how does Jesus answer him? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. Why? Because he's seen Jesus, and he knew Jesus. Thomas always, in the pictures that we see, seems a little concerned, a little worried, a little unsure, and I can really relate to that, as I'm sure many of you can. You know, sometimes we like to think that the apostles just, man, they got it, and they were, but not always. They had concerns. They were human, just like you and me. And that brings us to this final episode of Thomas. In John chapter 20 that we just read, where Thomas refused to believe what he had heard. And I'll tell you, as I read this, you know, we're going to like, we're going to bring out our inner SpongeBob. And I want you to really like use your imagination and picture yourself there with what's going on. Because when you picture yourself there, it's really an incredible story of what happened. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, verse 24, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks on his hands, put my finger where the nails were, Put my hand into his side. I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were in the house and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand, put it into my side. Stop doubting. And Thomas said, My Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. You know, before I get into kind of pulling that apart, when I, when I say imagination, I just want you to think about how unbelievably shocking that must have been. Here are the apostles. They are in a room gathered. And Jesus appears in their midst. Doors locked. Jesus appeared in, in their midst, not as a see-through spirit, right? Nothing like on Ghostbusters as an actual physical person with the holes in his hands and the holes in his feet. That's unbelievable. I, I, I always think about that. Jesus could do that right now if he wanted to. He could literally do that like right at this minute if he wanted to. Because I, I as, I, as I said that this morning, I started wondering if I could fit in here. Because if that happened, I would be diving into this <laughs> terrified because it's unsettling, right? And that, that's, that, that would be a shocking thing for them to see. So let's talk about this. First, the first thing that jumps out at me when I really spend some time thinking about this story is why wasn't Thomas with the other 11 at first? All the rest of them were gathered together. Where could Thomas have gone? He couldn't hide, at least not forever. But for some reason, he wasn't with the other 10 when they saw Jesus. Now, we're not exactly told when Thomas made contact with the other apostles. It could have been later that day. According to the first verse of John that we read, uh, Peter John, in verse 20, Peter and John had already gone to the tomb and found the tomb empty. Then Mary Magdalene stayed longer, and that's when this person appeared. As we discussed last week, Luke records the visit to the tomb and back made by the women, and, and then they came back and told all of the apostles. But in spite of all of this, Thomas refused to believe. 
And, and the thing that I really don't get is that Thomas really had no reason not to believe. Like, who told Thomas? Were these strangers? Were these people he had never met before? No. It was the other apostles, the other disciples that he had spent three years with. Like, you wonder sometimes, like, wouldn't you say, like, why would they be lying to me? Right? We have no reason to think that. And yet Thomas refused to believe. But Thomas now takes it even a step further. He takes it a step further. Thomas not only refused to believe, Thomas now sets up what his requirements for belief would be. Brothers and sisters, that's nothing really new, right? It's actually pretty familiar. People today demanding proof of something that can't be replicated. We see that all the time. I, you know, I use the example. People will say, how can you prove Jesus existed? How, how, can, you prove, how can you prove that he was really here? So here's my question. How can you prove that Alexander the Great existed? How can you prove that Julius Caesar existed? We believe the same kind of, of historical evidence for them that we refuse to about Jesus. Not like any of us knows Rufus and can just jump into the phone booth with him and go back in time. Let's see how many people pick up that reference. Bill and Ted is starting to get a little long in the tooth now, I know. But you can't just go back in time and see this stuff. But I'll tell you, it is such a pet peeve for me to hear that this, you know, I'm from Missouri. You're going to have to show me. Okay, I don't even know what that means. I'm from Missouri. You're going to have to show me. But the, yeah, I know, but what does that even mean? I don't understand. Like, show me what? You know, I don't understand that. Stuff, you know? I mean, I I don't know. I was going to start singing country grammar, and that would really mess us all up here. But the reality is that sometimes a demand for proof is really just an excuse for not believing. Thomas really didn't have any reason to not believe him. But sometimes it's just an excuse. Three years he spent with Jesus. Three years he spent with the apostles. It's, It's just unbelievable. And here's the other thing that I don't get, which makes it even more unbelievable. Thomas personally was with Jesus when Jesus told several different groups that even though they demanded a sign, they were not going to get a sign. Jesus actually said that the only sign that they were going to get was going to be the sign of Jonah. And what was the sign of Jonah? That just as Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of a giant fish, so too would the Son of Man spend three days and three nights in the center of the earth. So in our text, what we read was not only was Thomas demanding a sign, he was demanding a sign that was even more precise and more special than anyone else had been demanding. Brothers and sisters, if you think about it, it's a little surprising that a disciple, a follower of Jesus, who preached with Jesus, who served with Jesus, who knows so many things about Jesus that he was willing to say, let's go with him to Jerusalem and die, would now doubt all of the people that he knew and all of the brothers that he loved so much and the sisters that he loved so much. But here's the thing, and this is what we need to be thankful with the Lord. When you're dealing with Jesus, when you're dealing with Jesus, there's always a but then that follows it when Jesus is dealing with feeble and weak minded men and women, which is really all that we are on our best days. Between verses 25 and 26, we see an entire week's gone by, and we don't read that anything happened during those week, that week. No visits from the Lord, no visits from the tomb, nothing going on. The doors of the apostles gathering still closed tight because they're afraid of the Jews. And in verse 19, that's what we read. And thankfully, Thomas was there with all of them on this day. So here they are huddled up, doors closed. Physically, Jesus appears to them. And the other disciples had seen him already the week before. They knew it wasn't a ghost. They knew it wasn't a spirit. I thought about it this morning, even before church, as I talked to Russ. It is incredible to me that Jesus loved us so much that not only does he have a resurrected body, which we all aspire to, 
he chose on his body to leave the holes in his hands, to leave the holes in his feet, to leave the holes in his side, so that when we see him physically, we are ever reminded of what he did for us forever. He comes back and he, he said, he hears him say, why are you troubled? And I love the way Luke records this event in Luke 24. He says, why are you troubled? Why doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands, see my feet. It is I, touch me and see for spirit does not have flesh and bones as, as you have seen as I have. You see, Thomas not only missed out on seeing him before, Thomas wasn't there either when Jesus stopped down on the beach when he first saw them and had broiled fish with them. That, to me, is the best story of all of the resurrection stories. That's my favorite. That Jesus comes back, he's like, yeah, I'm hungry. Why don't you make me some fish? It's just such a, an incredible story to think about that, right? Such an incredible story. But finally here, Thomas sees and hears Jesus for the first time since the crucifixion. Can you imagine that? Can you truly imagine what Thomas must have been thinking? Can you truly imagine that? Thomas now had the chance to examine for himself up close and personal. And Jesus wasn't snarky. Jesus wasn't, you know, he said, Thomas, take a look. Here's my hands. Here's my side. Here's my feet. Jesus just presented to Thomas everything that he needed. There was no other choice that Thomas could make. And Thomas acknowledged immediately, Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my God. And you know, don't think that, that Thomas couldn't have been obstinate. And I think that's important. It's okay to express doubts. It's okay to, to have questions. But when the evidence is presented, it's no longer okay to keep doubting. Thomas saw it, and Thomas believed it. At that point, if you keep doubting, you become what James says is not good in James chapter 1 when he says that, that a person who has doubts is double-minded and tossed about like the waves of the sea. Thomas saw, and he had the humility to acknowledge, yes, I was wrong, I believe. And he did it immediately at any... Without any hesitation, the doubter no longer had any doubts about it. This was Jesus, and Jesus was alive. So how about you, brothers and sisters? What will you do with your doubts? What do you do with your questions? Because here's the reality of it. The worst mistake that anyone can do is to do nothing. You need to make a choice. Thomas had doubts. Thomas expressed those doubts, but when the evidence was presented, Thomas stopped doubting. His demands for proof, gone. We don't have, even have recorded that Thomas actually put his fingers in there. He just said, I, I get it. I get it. I, I, I got it. I, I believe the evidence. You can do the same thing, brothers and sisters. Once the evidence is presented to you, you can remove those doubts and then have the ability to simply say, my Lord and my God. I know people, and you know people like this too, where you can produce evidence on top of evidence on top of evidence, and at the end of the day, they'll be like, I still don't believe it. What are you supposed to do with that? What are you supposed to do with that? The thing is, Christians, we don't want to do that. You need to get that evidence. You need to stay and ask those questions and have those doubts removed. We have the word of God. You know what that means? That means that we can have blessed assurance. That means that we can stand on the promises because the word is there and the word removes all doubt. And that's what we're supposed to do, brothers and sisters. It's not bad to ask the question, but when the evidence is presented, then we put that doubt away. You know, this week for the third time, I, I, I'm going to jump into this. So I'm going to kind of skip. This week for the third time, I received an email message. Pastor, I just want to know, this eclipse, that's the rapture, ain't it? That's the end of the world coming, isn't it? I'm just like, no, 
I got to tell you, probably not. Okay? Probably not. You know, and I, and I, I start over. I said, you know, let's talk about the beginning, the beginning parts of it. Okay, first off, there's three eclipses a year that happen, and there's a full solar eclipse somewhere in the world every 18 months, which means from 2,000 years ago, there's been an awful lot of eclipses that have happened, right, number one. Number two, just because this eclipse is going over America doesn't mean that the Bible was written with America in mind. I know that's hard for us to get sometimes, but I'm, I'm, just, I'm just, just going over those things. And also then I said, let's go to some scripture. Let's go to the Gospel of Matthew. What did Jesus say in, in the Gospel of Matthew? He said, no one's going to know the day. No one's going to know the time. It's going to come like a thief in the night, right? We don't know any of those things. Now, could it be? It could, but we're not going to know about it until after it happens. So at the end of the day, what's the big thing? Don't worry about it. Because what does Jesus tell us? Have faith in me. Put your faith in me. That's what we're supposed to do. And then just not worry about it, right? How do we do that? How do we remove doubt? How do we remove faith? How, how, do we, how do we make it so that we don't have to have these worries? Brothers and sisters, get into the Word. Read your Bibles. Read them all the time. And there's no wrong way and no right way to read your Bible. You can read it fast. You can read it slow. You know why? Because the Bible has the words of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to make sure that you getting the, you're getting the nutrition you need. All you have to do is to willingly read it, okay? So since my brother is here today, I'll tell this. The first time that Lori came over to eat at, at our house, okay, Lori's family, all of them are painfully slow eaters, okay? okay? They like chew every bite of food 40 times before they swallow it, okay? One day... She sat down next to me and my brother Frank, and I'm pretty sure she thought that she saw a horror show because we literally, and we were on our third plate when she had like just finished her salad. We're like, I remember Frank and Dean are like, what's, I'm like, right? But here's the thing. She got the same nutrition that we got. The food was all the same. So whether you're reading fast or whether you're reading slow, just read it. Spend time with it. Pray about it. I'm going to tell you right now. If you need a if you don't have a Bible and you need a Bible, tell me. Anyone in this church knows one thing about me. There's two things that I love doing more than anything else at a church. Spending money and buying Bibles for people. If you need a Bible, it would be the delight of our church to give you a Bible. Okay? Because nothing, nothing will prepare you in your faith like prayer and spending time in the Word. You can listen to me. I can be the most brilliant speaker in the Word. I am nothing compared to this. I am nothing compared to the Word of God. Spend time in your Bibles. If you want a Bible app, that's great. Those are good to help. It doesn't replace, I don't think, a hard Bible that you can write in and note on and whatever, but get yourself a good Bible app. Blue Letter Bible, that is a great Bible app. Bible Gateway, that is a great Bible app. And get into the Word. And then the last thing is you're reading stuff in the Word. If you have questions, ask. I am available. I'm just saying me. I'm available to all of you anytime. Send a message. Send a question. And you know how many people we have in the church friends of yours that really know their Bibles, ask each other, challenge each other, grow with each other. That's the way we can continue to grow, to remove our doubts, to answer our questions. Last thing, and we're going to pray and go to communion. I was not what I would consider a believer the first time, when I first met Lori. And you know the one thing that got me about her that made me get into reading the Bible. I was actually embarrassed at how well she knew the Bible, and I didn't know it at all. And it forced me 
had to get into it. And thank God I did. Because there were a lot of doubts and a lot of questions and a lot of things I had that I asked a lot of people, and I never felt like I got the answer that I needed until I went to the Word of God. And then I got the answer straight from the source. Stay in your words. Stay in the Word. And when you have those questions, bring them to Jesus. And when Jesus gives you the answer, let those doubts be removed and truly, truly stand on his promises. Amen? Amen, brothers and sisters. Let's pray and we're going to go into communion. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord Jesus, strengthen us. Help us to be like Thomas in the sense that we bring our doubts to you, Lord. Let us truly be a people of the word. Let us truly be a people of prayer. And let us come to you with our questions. And Lord, answer them for us. Let us truly stand secure in your word. Let us truly stand assured in your word. And help to remove our doubts. Jesus, we love you. As we're gathered here today, at your table, Lord, we pray that you would bless and be with these elements would watch over them, you would be with them and in them and through them, that in partaking in this memorial, Lord, we may experience the same thing that that draws us closer to you, the blood of Christ, that you would have spilled, and we ask for you to be with us, our Savior.
our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, when we eat this bread, when we take this cup, we proclaim your glory. So as we leave this day, Lord Jesus, be with us and let us truly take all of our doubts, all of our questions, and bring them to you that we may have the eternal knowledge of you, Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus, we love you. Be with us this day and always, and we ask for this in your precious name. Please stand. Thank you. 